What does the Lord require of you? Micah chapter 6, verse number 8. Today we're going to think about that very question. Have you ever asked yourself, what's required of me? What, what does God want me to do? How does God want me to live? How should I act? What does it mean to really be a follower of God? Today, as we study the books of Micah and Habakkuk, we're going to make it so plain from Habakkuk 2, 2 verse 2 that we can understand and see clearly what God's message is through these great minor prophets. And so we hope you'll stay tuned as we're going to think about some highly practical and relevant messages from the books of Micah and Habakkuk. To destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ. To proclaim good news unto the poor. The Gospel of Christ. Spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the Gospel of Christ. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective Play Stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. The name Micah means, Who is a God like you? And it is a reminder from the book of Micah of the awesome nature of the God that we serve. Here's a little background about Micah himself. Micah was a contemporary. He preached at the same time as Isaiah and Hosea, very difficult times where people of God were not living like they ought to and many things were getting in the way. And so much of Micah's prophecy deals with that and the upcoming kingdom of the Lord, which we find out more about in the New Testament. So the key word to the book of Micah is judgment. There is judgment coming. It is an evil time. Micah says in Micah 2 verse 3 that we're living in, and he wants people to know what God expects of them, what they need to do to be right with Almighty God. And so we want to talk about some practical living messages from the book of Maya, Micah that, that teach us how God wants us to live. What's emphasized? Right out of the gate. The Lord emphasizes through Micah to the people that they desperately need to hear God's word and obey it. Look at Micah chapter 1 and notice what the Bible says, verse number 2. God says, Hear all you peoples, 
Listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. We hear those words and it reminds us much of what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 22, verse 29. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And Micah comes right out of the gate saying, it's time to listen up. Friend, we need to realize today that the message that God says to the seven churches in Asia Minor, to every one of them, is a powerful message to us today. To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. We need to listen to God's voice. Luke 8, 18, take heed how we hear. Mark 4, 24, take heed uh, what we hear. We need to listen to the voice of Jesus and the message of God, for it's that message that has the power to save us and turn us back to Almighty God. We need to realize right out of the gate from the book of Micah, the value of God's word to righteous people. Look at Micah chapter 2, verse number 7 with me. You who are named the house of Jacob is the spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these his doings? Watch this. Do not my words do good to him who walk uprightly. Friend, the word of God is not a, a drudgery. The word of God is not something that's going to hinder me or, or keep me from doing good. The word of God has great value to the righteous. L listen to Hebrews 4 verse 12. The word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We have within our hands the word of God that is so powerful. What do you mean so powerful? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16. It's that lamp that gives light to our feet along the path that we ought to go. Psalm 119, 105. It's that word which if we hide in our heart will guard us from sin. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. It's that word, Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And my friend, it is that which is able to save our soul. James 1, 21. We're to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. And so God says to Micah, and he cries out to us today, listen up, my words are going to help you in these difficult times. What is part of the message that would help the people of Israel during that time? They needed to learn to hate the evil and to love the good. Look at Micah chapter 3, and notice what is said in verse number 2. You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. God says judgment is going to come upon you. God's people have it exactly backwards here. They, they, they hate the good and they love the evil. Much like Isaiah 5 verse 20, uh, Amos chapter 5 verse 15, and it's backwards from Romans 12 verse 21. We are to cling to the evil, cling to the good, and hate the evil. But, but again, they've got that backwards. They think sin is pleasurable. They think it's so much fun. The ethical and moral decisions they're making, although they may not be right, they sure are good and enjoyable. Friend, as we live in a world today that seems to have things so backwards, the things that used to be and are still in the Bible morally wrong, we just now call those alternate lifestyles. People shacking up to living together. That's just a fun way of doing it. All the immorality and ungodliness and revelry and drunkenness that faces our society today, the sin and the drugs, those are just fun things to do. Friend, we, we, what we've done is exactly what happened in the days of Micah. We hate the good and we love the evil. We're putting the wrong things as our priorities. Friend, there's going to be a day of judgment when we have to give an account of those things. Just because it may be popular, just because political parties may be pushing that, just because a majority of people thinks that right and society and the world now approves of it, calling good things evil and evil things good, 
does it really change the inherent nature of them? We've got to learn to realize what's good, what's evil, what's holy, what's right, and what's wrong, and what's sinful. And Micah is trying to help us and God's people then do that. Now, throughout the book of Micah, we also get some glimpses about the kingdom and the Messiah. We learn from Micah chapter 4 where the future kingdom is going to be established at. Look at Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 with me. The Bible says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, and the latter days is a phraseology about the New Testament era, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What are we talking about here? Mount the Lord's house, the house of God is going to be established. But that house of God was set up a long time ago in Jerusalem. Well, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the future kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It was going to be set up in Zion, which is another word for Jerusalem. What do we, again, Acts chapter 2. Peter is standing there. Jesus had promised in Mark 9, verse 1 Assuredly, I say to you, there's some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom present with power. Some of those same disciples are right there and Peter takes the keys of the kingdom and he preaches the gospel and for the very first time, God added to the church daily those who are being saved. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.15, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself, listen now, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. What Micah say? The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in Jerusalem. Paul said the house of God was the church of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, I'll build my church and I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. Friend, we're talking about that future kingdom, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was promised by Micah to be established in Jerusalem. We also learn this from prophecy. We learn where the Messiah the anointed one, the king of kings, was going to be born at from the book of Micah. Look in Micah chapter 5 and notice what the Bible says in verses 2 through 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, from whose goings are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the lame Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. Matthew chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, Luke chapter 1. We know the story of Jesus. Mary goes into labor. Uh, Jesus is born in a manger in a basically a barn in the little town of Bethlehem. And what did the prophet say? Out of you, Bethlehem, shall come one who's to be ruler, the Messiah, the, the branch. Where was he going to come from? Quoted in Matthew 2, verse 6 as a fulfillment of Micah 2 verses, Micah 5 verses 2 through 5, identifying this was talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and every prophecy, Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. Now the question we began with, what's the Lord require of you? What does God expect from me and you, his people? How does God want me to live and act and relate to him and other people? Probably the key verse in the book. Look in Micah chapter 6, verse number 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Here it is. But to do justly, 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What's God want me and you to do? To do what's right, to do justly. What's that mean? To do the right thing, to follow his will. All God's commandments are righteous. Psalm 119, verse 172. To do justly means God wants me and you to do what's right. He then goes on to say uh, that we are not only to do justly, but we are to love mercy. We're to be a people of mercy. Are we looking for, are, are we like Jonah wanting God's people, God to wipe out the heathen? Age? No, we want mercy, compassion, forgiveness. Mercy is when we get that which we don't deserve. We want people to be saved for God's mercy and love to come to all people. And then what about my relationship with God? What does the Lord require of me? Listen to it again. To walk humbly with your God. What does it mean to walk humbly with God? It means this. I need to realize my place. I need to realize God is, a, is our creator. God's the father of our spirits. God is God. I am his child. I'm his creation. And I need to realize my place and to walk humbly, to willingly, faithfully, like a child to a father, submit to God, honor, reverence, respect him in my life. Let God be God. Let me follow in behind God and to have a, an humble attitude. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a, one a Pharisee, the other a Samaritan. The Pharisee stood thus and prayed with himself, God, thank you. Thank you that I'm not like everybody else. I give, I fast, like this heathen over here, I give, I fast, I pray, I do all these things. I'm just so thankful you made me better than everybody else. And the Samaritan wouldn't so much as raise his head to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. Jesus said, which of those two men went down, men went down to his house justified? The one who was glad he was better than everybody else, who thought God needed him on his side and who was really uppity, or the man who knew his place. He was a sinner in need of God's mercy. Friend, that's what it means to walk humbly with our God. Then consider this message from the book of Micah. It's a beautiful message. Here in the book of Micah, we see the, the power and the extent of God's forgiveness to his people. Look at Micah chapter 7. Such a beautiful verse. Micah chapter 7. Look at verses 18 and 19. A play on the name Micah itself. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity? passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because God delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. will subdue all our iniquities. Listen to this word picture. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Who's like God? So willing to forgive, so willing to forget. And when God forgives, he completely puts it out of his mind, puts it away. What do you mean? It's like this. Imagine you're standing on a boat out in the middle of the ocean. And the part of the ocean that you're standing over is known as the Mariana Trench. And in this spot, the ocean is 30, some 34,000 feet deep, some six miles deep. And God, with your sins, like dropping a coin, stands, holds his hand over the edge of that ship and drops it. And it goes in the ocean and it goes six miles deep into the bottom of the ocean. What's the chances of finding that again? God cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. When they're done away with, when they're put behind us, when they're no longer going to be held against us, when God forgets that, when God forgives and forgets, Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13, God truly forgives and forgets. And my friend, Matthew 26, 28 says this, as Jesus took that, that blood of the new covenant, that fruit of the vine which represented that blood of the new covenant, Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. He himself, bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes 
We are healed. What a beautiful picture of the faithful, forgiving God that we serve. Now let's take just a moment to think about the message of Habakkuk, which goes hand in hand with the book of Micah as well. Habakkuk, the whole idea of Habakkuk is, just like Micah teaching the people how to live, Habakkuk's message is the just, the righteous person, what the Lord require of you but to do justly, the just person shall live by faith faithfully trusting and following Almighty God. The key words in the book of Habakkuk are justice and salvation. God's message is his enemies, the Chaldeans, will fall, but God's people, if they obediently trust in him, they can and they will be saved. How then does Habakkuk bring this message out? As any message on justice and doing right ought to begin, it begins with the holiness of God. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1. Why, why do I need to live right and be holy? To be with God, that's what's required. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. We serve a holy God. You are of pure eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Who's the God we serve? A holy God. What do you mean holy? He's of purer eyes than to look upon wickedness favorably. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. His arm's not shortened. God doesn't have a defective arm, defective arm that he cannot save you. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Why do I need to walk by faith and do what's right? Because to be in the presence of God, I've got to strive for holiness each and every day. And friend, that message, that message of purity, that message of the just live by faithfulness, that message ought to be as plain and clear today as it was then. How plain did Habakkuk make it? Look at this imagery, Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at what's said in verse number 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he who runs may read it. Let me illustrate it this way. How plain? How clear, how crisp and easy to understand should the message of God be today? Well, just like then, God said to Habakkuk, I want you to make it so plain and write it so clearly and so big and so plain on tablets that if somebody's running, he can read it. Now, here's an illustration. The message of God ought to kind of be like a message on a billboard. You're driving down the interstate at 70 miles an hour, and your message on the billboard is just going to jump out. May just be a little, may just be a few words. It's always crisp. It's always clear. It's always to the point. That's the idea. God's message of doing justly, of attaining to the holiness of God. That's a message that ought to jump out at us because it's so crisp, so clear, and so relevant for God's people today. Friend, that message, as we think from the book of Habakkuk, is a message of making sure that God and His holiness comes first in our life. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 10. Notice these beautiful words. Habakkuk chapter 2. God says, You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and you sin against your soul. God doesn't want them to do that. Well, what does God want them to do? To look again to His holiness. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 20. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Friend, God wants me to focus on His majesty. His power, His preeminence in all things. God, picture like Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is brought up to the throne room of God, and he's called up there with a mission. And when Isaiah realizes where he's at and what's going on, do you remember what Isaiah says? Isaiah basically says, uh-oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, I'm undone. Woe is me. And God takes a coal, the angel takes a coal from the altar, cleanses, purifies Isaiah with that. And God says, who shall we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, Isaiah says, right here, I'll go. Isaiah was caused to focus 
on the majesty and holiness of God. Friend, that's what God wants me to look to. Don't get caught up looking around down here. Don't get caught up with the flesh and the desires and the passions of that. Get caught up looking up. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on, on things above, not on things of this earth. Look up, look to God, focus on God's holiness, and, and, and do your best to attain to and live a holy life every day. That's God, what God wants me to do. And friend, Habakkuk reminds us that God, who is our joy and strength, He's the motivation for everything we do. Look in Habakkuk chapter 3. Look at these beautiful words in verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the field yields no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He'll make my feet like the deer's feet. He'll make me walk on the high hills. Everything else may come tumbling down. Maybe difficult times. But friend, if your joy is not here on this earth, your joy is in Almighty God, that joy cannot be taken away. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, that we've got to run the race with endurance that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We need to run that same race with joy, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that. Won't you turn from a life of sin, turn to Jesus in repentance, and be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? If you are a child of God, then the message of Habakkuk is, and Micah is, let's do right, let's do justly, let's live like God wants us to, let's focus on His holiness. Join us next time as we study more from God's Word. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.